Well, greetings. We're going to uh, continue our study in the book of Philippians. Philippians chapter 4, we began looking at, uh, well, several weeks ago we began looking at this chapter, but last week in particular we focused on uh, verse 4 of chapter 4 where Paul says this, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. And this we're going to continue on uh, looking at this portion of Scripture and uh, moving on to verse uh Verse 5, let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ. The reason we're looking at this is because not only are we facing these days a physical uh, pandemic. We're dealing with this COVID-19 virus, but we're also dealing with a mental health pandemic. And I talked last week about uh, the um, the concerns over issues like anxiety and how there are really evidence to show that people are really uh, suffering, not only physically because of this pandemic, but also mentally. I was interested to note uh, that the World Health Organization says that the number one he- uh, mental health issue is anxiety disorders. Now, anxiety disorder, I think, are a lot different than what Paul is talking about here. Uh, if you have an anxiety disorder, you've got to see a doctor. You've got to make sure that you're taken care of. But you can also take these truths as part of uh of helping you to deal with anxiety in your life, because that's what Paul is talking about. Uh, it's obvious that the people at uh, Philippi were dealing with the issue of anxiety and a lack of peace. Uh, and so Paul says in verse six, do not be anxious. These are his closing words to these people. He's closing off his letter now to them. And he instructs them. He says, do not be anxious. So the Greek word there uh, that is translated anxious is a, a compound word. It means uh, uh, the first part of the word means to divide. The second part, the second word in this compound word means mind. So it means uh, to be anxious. It means to have a divided mind. Worry and anxiety are a serious spiritual problem. Paul uh, James talks about this. He says the double-minded man is unstable in all things. In James chapter uh, 1, verse 8, Jesus also, and so the the flip side of being double-minded is to be single-minded. And this is a focus again and again in the scripture. And Jesus emphasizes the importance of being single-minded in portions of scripture like Matthew chapter 6, where he talks about two treasures and two masters. And he talks about the importance of uh, worry, Uh, uh, and the impact of worry right after that. And he says to them uh, in that portion of scripture that they need to be single-minded. They can't be worrying about uh, what they wear, what they eat, uh, anything of that nature. But the single most important thing, the focus that we need to have, we can't have a split mind on this. We need to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. So, We need to understand that anxiety is not a sin. It's an emotion. It's something that we will experience uh, from time to time. It's unavoidable. Uh, It's a normal reaction to stressful situations. But some of us are living in what I would call a prison of anxiety. And this prison of anxiety, uh, Christ talks about that in Matthew chapter 13, verses 7 to 22. When we uh, let worry and anxiety preoccupy us, it chokes out the word of God. Uh, it becomes the, the driving force in our life. Worry causes us to abandon our trust in the Lord. Uh, because as Peter says, the Lord instructs us to cast our cares upon him because he cares for us. And the people at Philippi, had a lot to be anxious about. 
There was persecution, there was false doctrine, there was conflict in the church. So the question is, how can a person obey this commandment? How can we respond to uh, anxiety and stressful situations? Uh, how uh, were the Philippians, uh, according to Paul, to respond to these stressful, anxiety-creating situations? Well, he talks about that. That's what verse 4 and on to verse, uh, actually verse 9, talks about how we are to respond uh, to those stressful uh, situations uh, that create anxiety and angst in our lives. So the first thing he says, and we talked about this last week, rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord always. And that verb uh, rejoice is in the present imperative tense, which means it needs to be continual. It needs to be habitual. We need to be always rejoicing in the Lord. And in, and if that verb tense wasn't enough, Paul removes the kind of the expiry date on it when he says always. We are always to be rejoicing in the, the Lord. And it's so important that he repeats it. Uh, and we need to understand also that this is a command. When it's in the imperative, it means that it's a command. So what Paul is talking about here is not a feeling, but a command. He's talking about a decision, a conscious decision that we have to make to focus on the Lord, to rejoice in the Lord. And that kind of goes along with when he later on talks about think on these things, uh, uh, we need to have that on our mind all the time. We are rejoicing in the Lord. And that has been the constant theme throughout this book, that the Philippians need to rejoice in the Lord, not in what they can do, can't do, have done, anything of that nature. We need to focus on what God can do and is doing in our lives. So he gives them that command, rejoice in the Lord. Then he gives another command, let your gentleness be known. And that's a really interesting word that we have here uh, in the original language. And it really speaks about uh, a seasoned, mature uh, believer. I often talk about gentleness as a, a velvet glove, in a sense. You have this strong hand there's a strength in this hand, and you put a glove on that hand, a velvet glove. It's gentle, but it's gentle because you know that there's this great strength behind it. Uh, and so that's what Paul is really talking about here. It's talking about a, a mature Christian in Christ. Uh, and because I'm a mature Christian, I have this strength, this power be, behind me. I can be magnanimous and generous, especially in my dealings with other people. And it's the idea that I'm open-minded. It's understanding that there are more important things than my personal rights. And uh, Paul says that this is the preeminent characteristic of Christ in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1. So gentleness is based upon a, a great inner strength. Uh, gentleness, as we know, is, is the idea or is, is talked about as part of the fruit of the Spirit. When we have the strength of God in us, when we are dependent upon the, the Holy Spirit, it gives us a, a calmness, a coolness, a collectiveness uh, in stressful situations. Uh, it gives us a strength to deal with people in a gracious, magnanimous way. And that's this idea of gentleness that is, is evident here. Uh, let me just give you an example. I, I have a crack in one of the windshields of my car. So I went to uh, uh, an individual or went to a company to get it fixed. It's a smaller company. And they said, oh, yeah, we can do that. And they, they searched up the type of windshield. And they said, well, can you come back tomorrow? And we'll, we'll have it all. And we'll, we'll put it in. Well, I came back the next day and they got the wrong windshield. 
Well, it was, you know, there's part of me that could have been exasperated and upset with them. But then there was another part of me that said, hey, listen, what's more important? Uh, you know, this windshield or my testimony to this individual. And that's why Paul says later on, this is to be evident to all. He says, let your gentleness be evident to all, not just your brothers and sisters in Christ, but to everybody in the community. And see how we handle our problems speaks volumes to people about our relationship to Christ. Problems really demonstrate to others what is really important to us, what is uh, uh, really in our hearts and, and what is really at the source of our strength as individuals. And he says the reason for our gentleness is the fact that the Lord is near. Now, this statement in some ways is a little bit ambivalent uh, because it could be interpreted two ways. Uh, the statement, the Lord is near, could refer to the imminent return of Jesus Christ, the second coming of Jesus Christ, which we don't know when it's going to be, uh, when, uh, where, when it's going to come. But we know that it's imminent. We need to have that kind of mindset that it could happen any time. And that's a good reason in and of itself to rejoice, to be magnanimous, to put uh, up with the injustices that we may suffer through the persecution as the Philippians were facing or the persecution that we may face because of our faith. The statement also just gives us this, uh, this sense of urgency. So that's one way we could see this. The other way, the statement, the Lord is near, uh, it may also mean the Lord is close to you, that he is present. And therefore, on one hand, be aware of your conduct. You know, it's like the Lord is standing right beside you. Uh, be concerned about your attitude and how you treat people. But it also means that God is there to help us. It, it means that I'm not alone. It, 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 I may feel alone, but I know there's never a moment when God is not with me. It means that God will never leave me or forsake me. And that's the promise we see repeated again and again in the scripture, starting with Abraham, uh, well, even Christ's name, uh, when the angel came to Mary, uh, came to Joseph, he was supposed to name Jesus Emmanuel. Uh, God is with us. And so this is a great and important promise. When Joshua was going into that uh, promised land, when he was facing this impossible task, God said to him, you know, be single-minded. Don't look to the right and the left. Take courage because I am with you. And that's where Joshua's strength came from. And that's where our strength comes from, to be magnanimous with other people in our dealings as we are facing maybe calamitous situations. And then the next thing he says, we are to pray. Well, Again, how are we to respond to worrisome and stressful situations? What is the alternate uh, to alternative to worry and anxiety? Well, Paul says the answer is prayer. And he strings together these three words, these three words that uh, uh, really talk about different aspects of prayer. He talks about prayer. He talks about petition. He talks about uh, request. And we could delve into what's all being said there. But I think what Paul is doing here, he's emphasizing, urging the Philippians to find release for their anxiety in prayer and more prayer and more prayer. Uh, in saying this and, and describing it this way, Paul is really expressing the very personal nature of prayer. He is saying in effect, that prayer is a conversation with, a plea directed to, a request made, information given to God Almighty, our Father in heaven, 
who can hear and know and understand and care about and respond to the concerns that we have that otherwise might sink us into this uh, prison of anxiety. But the real emphasis here may be on an attitude of thanksgiving. See, Paul reminds us that all prayer must accompany an attitude of gratitude, if I can put it that way. You know, thanksgiving reflects, it reflects uh, or reflects humility. I'm coming to you, Father. It also demonstrates trust that God is greater than any problem that I have, that God can provide in these situations that seem to be on me. See, at the heart of this prayer with thanksgiving, why Paul can pray in this way is his belief in the providence of God. Think about the situation that Paul is in. He's in this uh, prison situation. He doesn't know whether he's going to live or die. He's being separated from friends and all the, the people that are important to him. He's being isolated from them. And yet he can say, and, and yet he can pray with thanksgiving. He can see how God is providing, because that's what providence for us in, in many practical, in, in many ways, means. Providence, that word means to supply what is needed, to, to give, sus, uh, to give, uh, to sustain, to support. That's the idea here. Uh, the providence of God means an act of providing uh, for or sustaining or uh, us and governing the universe. This is really why I can give thanks. I believe that God will provide for me in this stressful circumstance. The first time the word providence is used in the Old Testament is in the story of Abraham offering Isaac upon the altar. And that story is told in uh, Genesis chapter 2. And you remember this story where God tells Abraham to sacrifice Isaac. I can't think of a more stressful situation. I can't think of a, a, a situation that is just beyond my comprehension. But God is testing uh, Abraham because he knows how important, how, how, uh, how important um, Isaac is to him. He's the future. He's the promise. And yet God is telling me to take his life, to give him up. Uh, man, that, that's got to be an incredible, stressful situation. And, and uh, Isaac asked uh, ask his father, where is the, the offering? Where is the ram the, or the, the, uh, the sheep that we are going to offer? And Abraham says, God will provide. And that's the word that we have here. Jehovah Jireh. God will provide. And that's the nature, that's the first time we see it. And that's the context in which we see that word. And so when I pray, do I really believe that God will provide when things look bad? Do I really believe when I pray, can I pray with thanksgiving that God will provide when things look hopeless for me? Do I believe that the answer is found in Christ? You know, the ultimate proof of God's providence is the death of Christ upon the cross. There is no more evil deed than that. There is no other day that is so dark. 
No situation more depressing and hopeless. God not only knew of the crucifixion, he allowed the crucifixion. And as Peter would say later on in Acts chapter 2, verse 23 to 24, this man, referring to Jesus, was handed over to you by God, deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. See, everybody thought that the life of Jesus was over, but God. Jesus was dead and buried, but God raised him from the dead. God took the crucifixion, this ugly, terrible thing, and turned it into a celebration. So the question is, do I believe that God can do the same for me? Can I, with thanksgiving, in this hopeless, impossible situation that I'm facing, believe that God will provide. And that's what's at the heart of this, the idea that I believe God will provide. He is the source of my strength. And I pray this week that he truly will be that for you. Let's just pray. Father, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for the great uh, great evidence of your providence in that Jesus Christ died upon that Christ to provide for us salvation, something that was impossible to comprehend, how we can be reconciled with you. And yet your son, you sent your son to die upon that cross to provide salvation for us. We rejoice in that, Father. And I pray this week we will really see you as the one who can provide no matter what the challenge is. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. God bless you this week.